Right. So, it's my privilege to be able to speak with you this morning, and hopefully the message that I bring is one of love and hope in the midst of grief. Adam spoke to us uh, last week about all being part of one body, and Mary read us a scripture about being, us all being part of the one body from 1 Corinthians 12. And the section ends with these verses. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. So as many of us know, some of us may have found out this morning, uh, we lost Lynn Nichols this week. Um, Lynn is the wife, was the wife of Malcolm. Malcolm has been a leader here for many, many, many years. And as such, this will have an impact on us all. But there are others of us who are on a similar journey towards going to heaven, towards finding Jesus fully in the everyday. And others within our community are feeling deep emotional pain or are struggling with their physical or mental health. So it's right that we step aside from our everyday flow today and pause for a moment together. This passage tells us that when one suffers, we all suffer. And when another is honoured, we rejoice. And we all rejoice because that is what community is at its best. When we do things together, when we suffer together, when we rejoice together, that is community. When we choose to suffer together, we open ourselves up to pain. When we choose to love one another, we open ourselves up to pain. When we choose to commit to one another, there is a risk of getting hurt. But when we choose to belong, to put our fingerprint or our name, as we did last week on this particular body of Christ then we have become part of something bigger. And we will be affected deeply by what is going on in other people's lives. There's a, a beautiful quote from the TV show WandaVision, for those who miss my Marvel moments, <laughs> where Vision says, but what is grief if not love persevering? And as we grieve together, as we walk in people's pain together, we do so because of love. John 11.35 says, Jesus wept. There are different thoughts as to why it was exactly that Jesus left. Jesus wept. Some think it was simply because his friend Lazarus was dead. After all, Jesus was fully human and experienced grief the same way as we do. But I think uh, the part of the key to unlocking this verse is found two verses before when it says, when Jesus saw Mary crying and the Jews who were with her also crying, he was upset and deeply troubled. It wasn't just the death of a friend that grieved Jesus. After all, Jesus, more than any of us, knows the final destination of all who love him. Rather, I think it was the tears on Mary's face that brought tears to Jesus. When Jesus saw the look of sorrow and grief in Mary's eyes and on the faces who were, of those who were with her, he was overwhelmed with emotion He felt their pain, understood it, and he feels ours too. Hebrews 4, 15 says, We have a chief priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus understands our pain. He knows every scrape, every scar, every surgery. He knows every heartbreak and headache. He knows every loss. Sometimes people wonder where God is when it hurts, when bad things happen, when tragedy strikes. And the answer is, 
He's right here. He's in the middle of it, walking every step with us. I've found that there are places in Scripture that are powerful and deep, so that to recite them is to experience them. And I've found that Psalm 23 is one of those places um, I read somewhere that the psalm itself is a green pasture. The psalm itself is still water. And the psalm itself restores our souls. Psalm 23 is very personal. There are no references to we or us or they, but only me and my and I. This is David's testimony, his personal experience with God. It is precious. And if we let it, it can be a balm to our wounded souls. It can be the savlon to our hurts. And that is what makes this a constant friend. It has simple beauty. It speaks of green pastures and still waters as well as dark valleys and enemies and adversities and adversaries. But what comforts us, I think, is the fact that it helps us to feel through David (laughs) because David really believes this about God. We realise as we linger over the words that David writes, not poetic exaggeration or theoretical theology, he has experienced God in these ways, heard his voice, followed his lead, felt his care. Beneath the beauty of his words, there are solid convictions formed in the crucible of crisis, in the depths of pain and sorrow. Let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a psalm of hope. God is with me when things are good. God is with me when I'm tired. God is with me when things are really dark. God is with me and blesses me even when difficulties press in all around. And God is with me when I pass from this life into the next. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is with me. God is with us always. Now, during lockdown, 
a lot longer ago than I thought, I taught on lament. Lament is something that we need in these seasons. Today. Prayers of lament are a form of worship and faith. Lamentation is all through scripture and it's powerful. It's a meaningful form of worship because it places our love of God above even the worst circumstances in our lives. To lament in these hard times for ourselves, for others, is really important. And it can also be really good for our mental and physical health. When we choose to acknowledge how we feel, how we really feel, and to place that pain somewhere safe with God, it's good for us. God doesn't ask us to deny the existence of our suffering. Nothing in God asks us to deny that. He doesn't want us to pretend everything is okay, to put a nice little Christian face on and say, everything's fine. He doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to pour out everything we are thinking and feeling in the safe knowledge that he is a God who cares. We must not be afraid to come to God angry, fearful, overwhelmed, or to choose to welcome him into our pain. Scripture says... Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Welcome God. Welcoming God is powerful, like opening a door and inviting him in. And it's a good skill to learn in every single season. We need to choose to tell him exactly how we feel. And it doesn't matter if it isn't accurate. (laughs) Feelings are not always accurate to circumstances. It doesn't matter if it's accurate. It doesn't matter if it feels ugly or angry or awful. You are God's child, and what you are thinking and feeling are important. And he desperately wants to connect with you in this place of pain. And then after we have told God how we feel, we remember who God is. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Lament is not a pity party. It's a sharing of our pain. If we welcome God to be with us in it, if we imagine him in the room here with us, then it's hard actually to get lost in our pain. Because God's here. We need him to be our anchor. We need him to be our anchor. So it's important that when we have poured out our pain to acknowledge the truth that he is still Lord no matter what my situation. And in this place of painful prayer we then need to ask for what we need. Do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Ask We live in a fallen world. There is pain. There is trouble. And the God of the universe promises never to leave us or forsake us. Never to leave our sides. He wants to come close if we will let him. Finally, at the end of our lament, we honor God. And despite our pain, give him our worship. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will proclaim your praise. The Bible is full of lament. And as we feel pain and sadness for ourselves, for our friends and families, for Malcolm, Becky and Ian, Dan and Joe, Joel and Abby, let's turn our faces and our hearts and our prayers to God and ask him to be the good shepherd to lead and to guide, to protect, to prepare a banquet before us in the presence of our enemy, our enemy death, to restore our souls and to remember we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a painful day for us, but a glorious day for Lynn. No more tears, no more sadness, no more pain. 
but we are left with tears and sadness and pain. On the morning when Jesus uh, rose from the grave, the day of the resurrection, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. I want to leave us with this thought. In her agony, in her distress, Mary was still looking for Jesus. As tears fell down her face, he came to her, he spoke with her, called her by name, and he embraced her. (laughs) He told her not to hold on to him, which to me suggests she flung her arms around him, wanting never to leave again. I truly believe that when we cry, it is when our resurrected Lord Jesus often appears more clearly. For there's a sacredness in our tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are the messengers of, of overwhelming grief, of deep contrition, and of unspeakable love. Lynn is with Jesus. But here, love perseveres for what is grief if not love persevering. We cry for ourselves, for those who are a part of us who suffer, with the sure and certain hope that in this place of pain, in all of our places of pain, Jesus calls us by name and reaches out to embrace us. He understands and wants to love us in this place. So as I finish, let's stand together and pray. Lord Jesus, in this time of pain, we choose to fix our eyes on you. In this season of Advent where we prepare for your coming into this world, Come be with us. Comfort those who mourn. Be especially close with Malcolm, Becky and Ian, Dan and Joe, and Joel and Abby. As their love perseveres, hold them close to your heart. And may each of them know you come close through their tears. Help us, Lord, to love well to choose to walk the whole of life together in the sunshine and the rain, not to hide from one another or from you when things are tough. Help us to remember, Jesus, that you understand. You have suffered pain and loss, so we never need to suffer alone. So, Lord, we bring you our pain now and ask that you meet us here. We look forward in the true and certain knowledge that there will be a time when all pain and sorrow will be gone and we will be united again with those we have loved and lost. But until we are united again, be with us. We invite you, Lord, Holy Spirit, draw near. And pray, Lord, that you would fall. Holy Spirit, fall on us now. I pray that you would strengthen us and fill us 
and come close to us, that we would know your comfort so that we can be a blessing, that we can weep with those who weep to comfort those who mourn, to bind up the brokenhearted, to be a love that perseveres. Amen.